Hi, this is Jason Freston. And this is Michael T. Bradley. Welcome back to another episode of Spider-Man Dissembled. Let's talk about Amazing Spider-Man 555 to 557 by Zeb Wells and Chris Boccolo. Man, Boccolo, oh, it's such a mixed bag for me. I remember back when I absolutely loved Chris Boccolo. He was one of my favorite artists working in the industry. This was back in the days of Shade the Changing Man and then Generation X. He put zippers on the costumes. The man is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. But somewhere along the line, I don't know, I kind of lost uh, track of a lot of his work because he worked on more superhero stuff when I wasn't reading it as much. But somewhere along the line, he kind of turned incomprehensible to me. I recently read Mike Carey's entire X-Men Legacy run from the beginning, and there are points in there where I think even Mike Carey realized how bad it was because he would have characters call each other by their first name for no reason in every panel, simply because I think he knew that, like, for instance, when Cannonball and Alex Summers were on, I think that's who it was, were on the same page together, he knew that nobody would be able to tell them apart. So whenever they spoke, it would be like, yes, Alex, I agree. Good, Scott, I see your point. Or, uh... Uh, crap. Uh, thinking Alex and Scott. Anyway, it doesn't matter. He would do stuff like that and it was uh, because the art had gotten so bad. Bacalo's design sense is still awesome. He still does great covers, but interior art, not so impressive anymore. Don't know what happened there. I agree with uh, Michael on uh, Bacalo, uh, although, honestly, I never did. I never have. You can all yell at me for this, but I have never read Generation X, ever. But I loved looking at the art on it because it was awesome. And uh, I've still always been a fan, and yes, he does get, at times, very incomprehensible. I've also read that X-Men run that Michael was just talking about. But on the flip side, for these issues, I, I think overall he does a really good job with this. You know, there's a couple of places here and there where I'm not... I, I might lose track of things, but overall I thought he was an excellent choice for this type of, like, just totally off-the-wall storyline. It probably doesn't hurt that since it's red and blue against a white backdrop most of the time that it's it's easier to tell that, so... We start off with two pages before we flash back to the beginning of the story, which is a conceit that I hate. I'll admit I've used it before myself, but it was simply because, like I'm guessing everyone who uses that conceit, I was running short on pages, so I had to do it. If you're wondering, yes, I've written comics, no. No, you're not going to know what they are. Long story and nobody cares. Don't worry about it. I personally don't really so much mind the in-media res then cut to flashback on how our person got to that position start, as long as that start is a situation that you totally don't expect them to be in. You know, like, how did this happen? But in this case, it's just um, a Spider-Man fighting some, like, no-name villain in white in a snowstorm, so there's really not anything here that's really, like, how did he get to that point? Like, as, as a good example, for instance, where I wouldn't have minded that, perhaps, where we, if we were to start an issue with him giving mouth to mouth to Jonah and then it's like how did it get to him kissing Jonah like from the previous issues that that's a little bit more of the type of start like that that I like this one eh, not so much hey we get some crossover with the new Avengers which shows us that besides this existing in the current Marvel Universe simply with the registration act that yes this Spidey is in the new Avengers I mean I know that like the past couple of months or whatever we've gone through so far he's probably showed up in the new Avengers title but you know with Marvel's kind of flexible continuity in a lot of ways that doesn't necessarily mean anything. I mean, they could just do it so that the New Avengers storylines keep going until Bendis runs out of stories to do that involve Spider-Man and then he just kind of disappears from it. I mean, I could totally see that happening, the way that Marvel runs its continuity, but they don't. Instead, here we get confirmation, yes, he is actually in the New Avengers. So yay, Doc Strange. That makes me happy. I, I like myself some Doc Strange, and it is nice to know that he's still uh, that Spider-Man's still a member of the New Avengers, even if I think that kind of poses a lot more questions that we probably won't ever get the answers to, or at least not anytime soon. Although it is nice that we know for sure that the two books, The Amazing Spider-Man and New Avengers, are taking place in about as close to continuity as Marvel tends to get with each other. And Spidey seems really comfortable with all of them, like, joking and happy to be a part of them. So, I mean, that must mean that he didn't just, like, do some spell to screw them over and make them forget everything. Which, again, adds to the mystery of what the hell did Spidey do to make it so that people don't know who he is? How is that explained away if basically everything is the same? I am honestly sad to see Wolverine because, all right, so, so video game industry, there's a term called time to crate or time to box and it's essentially how long a game takes before you see your first crate or have to or see your first box or break your first crate 
And that, that's an indication that usually you see that because the developers have ran out of ideas. So the time to create is how fast it takes before the developer has no idea what to do with something. So they're like, let's just throw a crate in there that you break. So I like to think of Marvel projects of having a time to Wolverine. And considering Brand New Day has nine issues before we see Wolverine, that's not a good indication to me personally. You know, it's, it's kind of like, what else do we do right now? Let's throw in Wolverine for an issue. We. Possibly the most shocking thing in this entire three-parter, Spider-Man is funny. <laughs> I don't know if I necessarily laughed out loud. I'm not really a lol sort of person, but I definitely like smirked at Spider-Man and Wolverine's exchange. Like Spider-Man basically just offhandedly asks Doctor Strange how the weather's gonna look through the day. And he like does a spell to kind of figure it out. And Wolverine's like, yeah, this is a good use of his time. There's more than that. It's, it's just a really funny exchange. That being said about Wolverine, yes, actually the entire exchange, the whole reason that Spidey's at Doc Strange's Sanctum Sanctorium is hilarious to begin with. Like literally, he just just wants fun cereal, so that that's pretty entertaining. And and I will say, yeah, overall, this is actually way funnier than any of the stuff that we've gotten so far, which is nice. I I really did dig this, uh, the the comedy in this. So. Yay! We see a little bit with Pete and Dexter Bennett. I actually really like how Bacalo draws Dexter Bennett. I think he captures his face in a way that it's, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of impressionistic. Like, it, it captures only little beats of the entire face, but it works really well for Bennett for some reason. And the gigantic overdone coat he gives him just works perfectly for that character. So boisterous and ostentatious. Sadly, though, Betty in that scene is approximately the width of, like, the two-dimensional man or something. Poor girl. She's just a little little stick with a bump up top on the front and a little bump on the bottom at the back. So, oh well, what do you do? And Bennett's interaction with Peter is also enjoyable. Not as, like, say, laugh out loud funny as with Wolverine, but it is really well written. Speaking of really nice funny moments, I thought it was awesome that the sound effect for Wolverine's claws retracting is Tikins, which is, of course, snicked backwards. All right, so I also like the little dig that he makes the Scarlet Spider costume while he's out here freezing in the cold, which which obviously at this point in time, you know, if you've been paying attention to solicits and reading Marvel, we know that the Clone Saga still is in continuity, but at this point in time, it's the uh, first indication we have that the Clone Saga actually did happen, so that's, that's also nice. So into our story finally, uh, Spidey goes out for cereal essentially, and he and Wolverine end up fighting samurai snow demons. There's also Mayan math magic involved uh it's kind of complex backstory for what's essentially like an extended fight scene so i'm not going to go into it it's kind of fun though yeah the storyline here is really just kind of like crazy off the wall which makes me think that wells is you know writing for Bacalo. you know i mean he realizes that his art is just like this really stylized you know, he can get pretty crazy with it. So I wonder if he was just kind of saying like, well, what types of, what types of things can I mix together? A snowstorm and, and, and Mayans and crazy math. And yeah, you know, this will just, you know, here, draw the hell out of this. Yay. We also get what I assume must be one of those modular subplots that Braveort was talking about. J. Jonah Jameson tries to escape. We see him attempt to escape from the hospital. Sees it's a blizzard outside, doesn't get very far. So yeah, back to the plot, kind of, we have multi-dimensional beings that are, like, brought here by math. This is like the movie Pi intersects with Spider-Man. It's really odd, but really fun. Another thing that I actually really like about this story is it's not a traditional Spider-Man story. It's a little bit outside of his, his wheelhouse, which is nice because, you know, they keep saying that Spidey doesn't do dark. You know, like, Spider-Man's not made for dark. Spider-Man's not made for dark. And really, when you kind of get right down to a lot of the stuff that happens in this, it's pretty dark. I mean, you know, Peter's not dark during it. But the story itself does kind of take a little bit of a more sinister bend to it. But, I mean, even past that, I mean, it deals with mysticism, which is another thing that supposedly is outside of Spider-Man's standard tool set. So there's just a lot of really fun ingredients thrown into this big pot, and it works really well, I thought. We get Crazy Vern the bum! Crazy Vern! <laughs> also, we get a little bit more with the fact that Vin, the cop, hearts Carly. It looks like Vin and Peter are going to be future roommates, possibly. 
Spider-Man being really cold and stuffing his costume with DBs to keep warm. And by the way, when we say DB now, that refers to the Daily Bugle. It gets changed to DB, not decibels or the band DBs, which would be also an interesting image, but no. So Spider-Man stuffing his costume with DBs to stay warm. Absolutely hilarious. Okay, so one of the great things about that scene with Vern is how Spidey just pops out out of a snowdrift. Like, seriously, did he just burrow through the other side? Like, it's, it's awesome. He's just like, boom, how? Howdy there, mind if I join you? I, I thought the visual of his head just sticking out of this, just talking to Vern, and Vern's just like, you know, it's all cool. Like, he doesn't even seem phased by it at all. It's just, I loved that. It was just brilliant. When Spidey fights the ice demon thing, every line in that first matchup is absolutely priceless. Like, Vern the bum. Crazy Vern! <laughs> kept bitching about how S.H.I.E.L.D. was out to get him and kind of paranoid ranting and Spidey says the Ice Demon. By the way, if you're with S.H.I.E.L.D., Vern went that way. I also, uh, during that fight with the Demon, couldn't help but keep thinking of like, are you a god? Then die! You know, so next time Spidey asks, if somebody asks you if you're a priest, you say yes. The Demon says a line, you carry the sun blood to Spidey, and I'm wondering, is that because his blood is radioactive? Or does that mean something else? I thought that was an interesting line. Yeah, the sun blood thing is interesting. I didn't think about that, but he doesn't just say, you know, you carry sun blood, you carry the sun blood. Like, you know, a singular important thing. So maybe it's possible they are, you know, this is a foreshadowing to something coming up, but I don't know. That's an interesting thought. They keep talking about how we're, uh, this uh, ice demon thing is from another dimension and it's allied, it, it's like in sync with ice and it has rules that it follows and it has like a champion and that kind of started making me wonder could this demon be from where the totem spider god came from i don't know how much that's in continuity anymore but i thought it might be an interesting way to tease that that still is in continuity so the supposed mathematician that Spidey saves at the beginning of the story and is staying at the police station while he goes to rescue the other hostages turns out to be the bad guy oh no for all of you long-time Spidey fans, we know that Robin is a bad guy because he made a deal with the demon. Yes, if you're playing along at home, kids, only bad guys make deals with Satanistic beings, okay? So in part three, we have five inkers. Seriously, five inkers were necessary to get this damn book done? I assume that each one of those inkers were slowly sacrificed to the Mayan math god. That's just what I'm guessing. And we get to see Vern and his hobo mob in action. Hobo mob! And it just kind of wraps up. So let's talk about the web shooters for a moment. I don't really have much to say on this topic, but I thought it was worth bringing up. Here's how I feel about it so far. We don't really know what happened with Spidey. We don't really know what's up with the brand new day stuff and how it relates to the one more day thing, and we're trying not to worry about that, but even if we kick out one more day, we still have things like the other and, and the disassembled uh, storylines to talk about and the fact that they seem to have disappeared from continuity. And I think they're far enough in the past that we can bring those up and ask these questions. Where the hell are his organic web shooters? If I'm not mistaken, I believe in Ultimate Spider-Man he has organic web shooters. And of course that's what they used in the movie because organic web shooters are just easier to explain away and deal with visually, etc, etc, etc. Yeah, I'm... <sighs> I'm a little bit confused as to the lack of organic web shooters also because part of me wants to be like, well, obviously they wanted to get back to basics. The most traditional version of Spider-Man is one that has web shooters and is not using organic webbing. And that probably would have held true for sure like 10 years ago, but after the, uh, after the movies, I would think that a lot, and I could be wrong, I mean, I totally could be wrong, but I would think that a lot of lay people that's really only familiar with um, uh, Spider-Man via the movies and some of the cartoons and whatnot would be much more familiar with the Spider-Man with organic web shooters than the, the mechanical ones. It seems like the main reason that they brought it back is for story ideas. Again, not to harp on this, but it seems like those stories have been done. You know, it's like bringing back the Rhino because you think the Rhino's awesome and then just they get into another fight. To me, the entire purpose of bringing it back would be to do something new with it. So I can't imagine they got rid of the organic ones because of accessibility of character. But on the flip side, it seems as though they feel 
still a lot of backstories required to explain the organic web shooters. Like, they would have to actually go back and explain the other and explain JMS's run and stuff like that. That's almost what they feel like they're, they're trying to say here by going back to the mechanical ones, is uh, they can't just let him have organic because then people will ask, why does he have organic? And if he has organic, then they have to be like, well, yes, the other's around, JMS's run is still around, the Totomic entity is still around, or, you know, the Totomic origin may or may not still be around. So I think this is just their way of possibly just their way of retconning things without actually do like a soft retcon. They're just hand waving it and ignoring the fact that he had organic ones and hoping that people kind of just end up forgetting about it as well and then it won't even be an issue anymore. The organic web shooters just seem to kind of be put in there to make the stories easier to tell. It's like the sonic screwdriver in Doctor Who. I mean, if you use it as a get out of jail free card all the time, then it gets annoying and it gets in the way of the story. But if you want him to be able to get out of a room and move the plot forward really quickly, having him have the sonic screwdriver works for those reasons. I think the organic web shooters, it's the same thing. You don't want to make everything too easy for Spidey, but when it comes to simple things like this, where he's already thought up ways to get around the web shooter problems. Why not, right? So we're left with two possibilities. Either he doesn't have the organic web shooters anymore, and that means continuity changed a lot, because that means that essentially disassembled happened a lot differently, and the other probably happened a lot differently. Both of which is doable, I guess, but it seems like, do they really want to deal with that? I'm not sure. The other possibility is that he has the organic web shooters and he's not using them anymore for some reason. I don't know why he wouldn't be. The entire world probably never really understood the difference between him having organic web shooters and him having mechanical web shooters, so it's not like now he's protecting his secret identity more by not using it, because that's kind of the only rationale I could think of. So it seems as if he's not using them for some specified reason. I can't think of one, so I guess there's a mystery there which I'm kind of curious about, or he just doesn't have them anymore, which is a mystery that just baffles the hell out of me. I mean, I guess it's possible he just never ran into whatever it was in Disassemble that made him get it, and that he, you know, didn't die in the other and blah 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 blah, but uh, that seems weird. That seems like an unnecessary thing to change because it doesn't play any part in the story. Yeah, fun, fun tidbit. He got his organic web shooters by being impregnated by a spider god queen and then dying and rebirthing out of his huge spider corpse. So there's a lot of Mm, weirdness there on on the origin of the web shooters, which is why I'm I'm honestly I'm still going with what I was saying before. I really think that it is their way of doing a soft retcon. You know, they just they're not going to mention it. They're going to hope nobody else mentions it. And if nobody talks about it for 15 years, well, guess what? It never happened. At least I think that's what they're going for. Yeah, so that's basically my summation of where I feel with the web shooter thing. Very straightforward, very basic. I don't know why it's an issue. It becomes distracting simply because we're dealing with that when we could be dealing with other stuff. As Jason pointed out, kind of the only one where the web shooters and dealing with that issue, the only place where it was believable was where it was because Spidey didn't have the money. Well, we're dealing with Spidey's money issues in a lot of different ways. Peter's money issues, I should say. His money issues in a lot of different ways, so it just seemed unnecessary. Beyond that, it's a mystery that we'll probably never get an answer to, and it's just very frustrating and distracting. That's how I feel about it. Wanted to end on a positive note, however, and say that this three-parter I thought was very enjoyable. Very fun. Thought it probably could have been a two-parter, maybe even a one-parter, but it had a lot of great moments and I really, really enjoyed it. Again, it works best because it's mostly Peter as Spidey, not as Peter, which is maybe bad, but that's how I feel. Yeah, I totally think this could have gone away with a two-parter. You know, I, they'd have to move around subplots, obviously, of course, but I think there's way too much subplot action going on in this This to have uh, made it as small as a one-parter. But, you know, yeah, they, they could have totally moved subplots around for that, just to, to facilitate there. Not much got advanced here, not much got done, except for uh, this just felt like a fun little side quest thing. Which is really how Spider-Man seems to be working best right now. Again, this could be a problem, but when I enjoy them, I'm not going to bitch about it. It. Overall, though, since the uh, beginning of Brand New Day, which, you know, albeit has only been a couple of storylines, this one has been really my favorite, hands down. I mean, it it was funny. I really liked the, the art. I loved the, that crazy gonzo over-the-top concept for what this is. It's just... You know, pretty much top to bottom. I, I really liked this. Now when I think, what did Zeb Wells write? I will be thinking to myself, Zeb Wells wrote the first post-Brand New Day storyline that I really liked. So so now I, will, I fully admit that I am looking forward to the next one that he ends up writing. 
Well, I think that about wraps this one up. Uh, this is Jason Freston. Thank you for listening to Spider-Man Dissembled. This is Michael T. Bradley.